sculpture as this portable, precious object that is enshrined within a sacred cultural space, such as a museum or a gallery. They were also pushing against the commodification of art, that art was something that was purchasable and that its value included a monetary value. We see that artists being, begin creating works of art known as land art. This is artwork that's placed within a natural environment that was in some ways intended to be part of the landscape. Now, as you will see in this lecture, land art relies particularly on the relationship that the artwork has to space and the active viewer experience, one that typically involves movement. This again is probably gonna be the most important thing to keep in mind. Space and active viewer experience that typically involves movement. Now to me, I see this as a very contemporary approach to the age old concern of man versus nature. Now, one of the many things that makes Arizona pretty much the best place ever to live is that we actually have quite a bit of land art in a relatively close proximity to us. This is primarily due to our breathtakingly beautiful natural landscapes and the fact that these landscapes are expansive and they're wide open. So a lot of the um, land art that you'll see is relatively close here. If you do a little online research, you can find uh, land art that you can go and see that's not too terribly far to travel. Now, we're looking at a photograph here of Walter De Maria's lightning field, which consists of approximately 400 steel poles, each 20 feet tall, arranged to create a square grid that measures one mile by one kilometer. Now, this piece is located in an area of New Mexico that is well known for its frequent electrical storms, with this idea that the steel poles will attract the lightning and create all of these incredible patterns of light in the sky like what we're seeing here. So let's think of experience, right? An important component of land art. First, this piece is located out in the middle of nowhere. Per De Maria's argument that, and I quote, isolation is the essence of land art, right? So you have to travel to get there, right? Think of it as a sort of pilgrimage, which can be considered something akin to a spiritual experience. He also limits the number of visitors, a maximum of six at a time. So you travel all the way to get there. And once you get there, the piece is intended to be experienced over an extended period as you look to the sky and wait for what transpires. Now there are two types of land art. One that we see here is called site work. Now with this designation, site work. This means that the piece is placed within an outdoor environment. That's what makes it land art, but right, these are the unique features. Site work is made of man-made sculptural materials with the intent to temporarily alter the environment. Right? I'll repeat that. Made of man-made sculptural materials with an intent to temporarily alter the environment. We have here Richard Serra's Tilted Ark, which was made specifically to be placed in the Federal Plaza in New York City. So it was created to dictate viewer movement, right? Again, think of active experience, by having the viewer walk around the wall as they move through the plaza. Now, because the wall tilts, which you can kind of see in this picture here, because the wall tilts, it's intended to be dynamic and therefore to alter the viewer's perception of the space as they move around. Now this piece was in the plaza for about four years, no problem. There really wasn't much of a negative reaction, but then an administrator within the federal building came into power, so to speak. His name was William Diamond and he did not like Tilted Arc. And so he began an active campaign to have it removed. Now what's the problem, right? Well, for Diamond, first of all, he felt like art, arc, tilted arc, was like a scar on the plaza, right? And that it was a target for graffiti. 
Because people had to walk around the work to enter into the plaza, Diamond felt that it interfered with the public use of the plaza. Now, to reiterate, for Sarah, the fact that you had to walk around the work to enter the plaza was the point of the work of art. It was about presence. It was about change. Now, there was also an underlying political message as well, where Sarah felt that the American people were divided from their government. And so he had the ARC physically divide the public from the federal administrative buildings. And maybe that's too why Diamond wasn't super into this piece, is it's not exactly a positive reflection of the institution with which he administrates. Now, eventually, Diamond's crusade to have this uh, removed caused a legal battle over whether or not it could or should be taken down. Now, the administrator tried to compromise. Diamond was saying, okay, well, how about we just pay to have the work relocated? Now, Sarah, he maintained that that was not possible because the work was site-specific. And what this means site-specific is that it was created specifically for that spot. That the art, because it's site-specific, the art is inseparable from the location for which it was designed. That with site-specific work, the location plays a significant role in determining the work in its final form. It affects its scale. It affects the materials. It even affects the content. That last part is particularly important. That the location is what gives the work of art its meaning. Sarah argued that because the work was site-specific, to relocate the work would essentially then be to destroy it because you're taking away its meaning, its context, its message by removing it from the site that was it meant to uh, occupy. Now, unfortunately, Richard Sarah ended up losing the case and the piece was dismantled and destroyed in 1989. Now, this situation presents some important things for us to consider. Let's consider these at the outset of this lecture, right, regarding land art. Because land art is located in public spaces for all to see. What role does the public have in deciding what is placed in their spaces? Does one person, such as Diamond, have the right to advocate for the removal of something that he personally doesn't like? How does public art define the community in which, it's, in which it's placed? Now, there's no easy answers to the questions I've just posted. And this became a, really apparent in recent years with the removal of Confederate sculptures across our country. And this was happening uh, back in 2015 through 2017. <clears throat> now, at the University of Texas at Austin, there was a sculpture of Robert E. Lee that was removed from a public space on the campus. And then there was the removal of four other sculptures um, of Confederate generals, and that happened again two years later. So a total of, of five that were removed. Now, in this case, the decision was not like one person on a crusade, but it was a community-wide one, arrived by a consensus of staff, faculty, students, administrators, even alumni were asked to weigh in. So this is a wide range of people that together agreed that these sculptures represented problematic political and cultural ideologies that no longer represented this institution of learning. Now, just because the sculptures were removed doesn't mean they were destroyed. Rightfully, the university acknowledged that these artworks are representations of our country's history. Just because we aren't proud of our, the history doesn't mean that we get to sweep it under the rug. Now, because these sculptures were not site-specific, they technically were not destroyed simply because they were relocated, which in this case, they were relocated to the Briscoe Center with the purpose of being available for scholarly study. There are other solutions to this that have been suggested. In some cases, the sculptures remained in public locations, but with plaques that educated the viewer on the country's imperfect history. For example, in Virginia, they have a law that prevents them from taking down these sorts of sculptures. And so um, what they would do then is in these instances where you have statues in public locations that honor Confederate soldiers, they would have plaques and they would have statements such as one, for example, I'll read to you. This monument 
fostered a culture of segregation by implying that public spaces and public memory belonged to whites. The point is, is that there is a relationship between public artwork, space, and the people who see the artwork. These solutions are the best we can do in addressing a really complex issue and that they involve a compromise. The role that artwork has in articulating history and culture is preserved, but not at the expense of the community that it represents. And on the other side of the same coin, the community has a say in the ways in which it's conceptualized, but not at the expense of a visual record of the past. The point is, is that this sort of thing is not a solution. As an art historian, this sort of thing really upsets me. I don't care what the artwork represents, it should never be vandalized and it should never be destroyed. To allow artwork that makes us uncomfortable to continue to exist, it doesn't mean that we think that the ideas that it represents are acceptable. Rather, what it means is that we are reminded of a past that we choose not to repeat and with solutions like I've outlined in the previous slide, we can reconcile with this past a new context that makes for this, you know, understanding our relationship to these ideas more of a tolerable process. So that's a little a tangent that I went off on. Let's get back to land art. Now, this work is by the artist couple Christo and Jean-Claude, who are especially well known for their large-scale fabric-based land art. Now here we will look at their valley curtain, which consisted of a 200,020 square foot orange nylon curtain that was strung across Rifle Gap near Rifle, Colorado. This work dates from 1970 to 1972. Now what's going on during these two years that it took for this work to be completed? This is an important part of Christo and Jean-Claude's work and it comes down to process. Process, which seems to be a common factor in many of the land works in this lecture. Here's some pictures. First, as part of the process, is they would document the initial idea thoroughly through sketches and other preparatory means. They would be in meetings galore as they would seek to obtain all sorts of permits that would be necessary to put up giant fabric works of art out in nature. Then what they would do, and this is what we're seeing here, right? Here's one of these meetings, this is Christo, right? This like 70s boss right here. He's in a meeting to seek out uh, a permit standing in front of his preparatory drawing of Valley Curtain, right? Then the other thing that they would do as part of the process is when it was actually time to install it, they would document this with photography. Now, this is typical of most all of their works, you know, this thing of, you know, sketching it out, getting the permits, being in meetings, and then building it and taking pictures of them building it, right? So this is typical. Now, for this one, this particular endeavor required about 100 temporary workers, and uh, it took 100 temporary workers to install the first curtain, which was destroyed by wind in 1971, and then they installed the second curtain in 1972. Now this piece in the end cost around $500,000, half a million dollars to create, and they accepted no outside funding. They paid for all of this themselves, and this is also typical of their work. Now no one just has half a million dollars laying around, not even Christo and Jean-Claude. So what they did to earn the money to create these works is they would then sell the photographic documentation, they'd sell the preparatory drawings and sketches, and all of this together, again, is that rejection of the commodification of art that is an aim in so many examples of land art. Now for Christo and Jean-Claude, the works are not simply about process and the rejection of the commodification of art. There's more to it. Also, their installations are intended to be temporary, large-scale environmental works that have in them simultaneously elements of painting, sculpture, and architecture. Now let's break down what I just said here. There's many layers. We see the element of painting in the vivid color of the cloth, this orange that sharply contrasts the surrounding landscape. The element of sculpture is seen in the form of the fabric, 
the shape that it creates. The architecture is seen in the ways in which the elements hold the fabric upright, the way in which this whole operation is constructed. Now together, all of this works to create a sort of artificial barrier, or perhaps an artificial extension of the landscape. It certainly is highlighting the topographical contours of this area, while also making visible that which is typically intangible in nature, namely the wind. It introduces to us a new way to see a familiar landscape. And finally, this idea of pilgrimage and that people travel far and wide to see a Christo and Jean Claude piece because they're pretty major artists in the art world. Now this has led some to criticize their work because with all these people coming to see the work, it puts a strain on the landscape. And I think that is definitely a fair point. Now, after two years of work and all the rigmarole that I described to you and the immense cost and effort to construct and install this fabric curtain, it was taken down after only 28 hours due to the curtain being damaged by high winds that were averaging about 60 miles an hour. Now, this might seem very tragic, the short lifespan of the work after all of this effort, but this was okay with the artists because this work was in intended to be temporary all along. And it was nature that got to decide how long the work stayed up. Now let's talk about another type of land art, which is called earthwork. Earthworks, they are also located in outdoor environments. Again, that's what makes them land art. But these are made of natural materials, and they're intended to merge with or complement the landscape. So site works, they're man-made materials. They temporarily alter the environment. Earthworks are natural materials. They merge with or they complement the landscape. Andy Goldsworthy is one of my favorite earthwork artists. He uses the raw materials found in nature to create his works. He goes out into nature with no preconceived ideas as to what he's going to do, no plan beforehand. And he allows the seasons and the weather to determine the materials that he's going to use. And then also it, it uh, determines the subject matter of his work. So once again, process based. Sort of like with Christo and Jean-Claude, nature has a say in the final form of the artwork. For Goldsworthy, the result as we can see here, are subtle, unassuming, elegant, nuanced works that do much to highlight the natural beauty of the materials he works with, where the viewer is encouraged to focus on the details, the lines, the shapes, the colors, the space that these assemblages occupy, these details that we often overlook and take for granted. Now, just a little by the way, if you want to learn more about Goldsworthy's work, if you want to actually see him work within the process I described, I'd like to recommend a fabulous documentary called Rivers and Tides, Andy Goldsworthy Working with Time. Rivers and Tides, Andy Goldsworthy Working with Time. It's so good. Now, let's talk about time since uh, Andy Goldsworthy's bringing it up. As you can probably get a sense of here, Goldsworthy's works are meant to be temporary. They're meant to be rapidly worn away by the natural environment to show how nature is always changing. It's temporary. His works make apparent the passage of time and the ephemeral beauty of nature, a beauty that resides in the everyday if we are willing to look around and acknowledge it. With this emphasis on the passage of time, with the use of seasonally specific materials, what Goldsworthy is really seeming to do at least in my mind, is to highlight the cyclical nature of nature, with perhaps an emphasis within this cycle on decay. Now keep in mind, Goldsworthy's work is not simply about the beauty of nature, but it's also about the relationship between humans and nature. Where often he examines the control we have over nature and the control that nature has over us. We think that we control nature, this is represented in Goldworthy's deliberate arrangement with 
of the material that really makes him almost like he's collaborating with nature, right, to make this. But he's the one that determines the way that this is arranged. So he's suggesting power through arranging these, these forms in ways that are pleasing to us aesthetically. But yet in the end, all we need to do is experience something like an intense storm or an earthquake, and it's very clear that nature holds the power. And we see this with the fact that these arrangements that Goldsworthy made, his expression of dominance over, relation, over nature, if we want to call it that, I again prefer collaboration, that in the end that they, they waste away, that they're gone. The point is, is that we are one with nature. We are non-separate. Now this piece is by the well-known land artist, Michael Heiser. To create this piece, and this is one of his earliest of uh, his land art, he gouged out 240,000 tons of land from the pristine landscape of Mormon Mesa in Nevada. The result was two enormous trenches facing one another. As the title of the work implies, double negative, the work itself is actually a void. It's the space, and it's actually two voids. Well, it's actually three voids if we count this ravine that runs in between the two of them, these two trenches. There's this emphasis on space with these voids, and it echoes one another, right? It tracks one another, it refers to one another from across, across this void here. Now, regarding this piece, the artist said, there is nothing there yet it is still sculpture. Hmm. Who was someone else that we learned about that was also into this concept of the void? Maybe pause the video and think about it. And if you thought and thought and thought and you still don't know, let me give you a hint. This person, this artist, who also is into the void, made over 200 monochromatic, incredibly beautiful blue paintings that address this concept. If you still can't remember, let me give you another hint. He took the idea of the void one step farther and he made a gallery that was simply an empty space. I'll give you a third hint. He was a judo master. That's right, Yves Klein. So similar ideas that Heiser is working with to show that at least in this piece, with its emphasis on nothingness, that there's a, a strong, very high conceptual aspect. Now, you can see here a car, you can see here a person to give you a sense of scale. And I point this out to not only give you a sense of how large double negative is, but to encourage you to once again think about the relationship that man has with nature. Now, there's something of a sort of contradiction to me here. First, we've got a large scale and this encourages the viewer to feel in awe of the landscape to feel as though we are relatively minor in the grand scheme of things. But yet, there's such human bravado represented in this piece, and not necessarily in a good way. The suggestion that man dominates nature, right? It's not a Goldsworthy thing where he's like, just like delicately arranging objects that he found that nature will kind of take back to their original position, not collaboration, but here a domination, right? This was, as I said, a pristine landscape that Heiser now marred. Do that like Google sky, Google maps, Google like satellite, whatever thing. Type that in um, and look at this from an aerial view. It's like two scars. Literally, it looks like two scars on the landscape, right? He's bringing in all, you know, this, this earth mover machines or whatever they're called. What did this do to impact the natural ecosystem? How is this ecosystem continually being impacted with all the people that pilgrimage out, you know, year after year to see double negative? Now, Heiser has said, and I'm not going to lie, this quote kind of bothers me in the context of this piece, right? This is a quote from Heiser. In the desert... I can find that kind of unraped, peaceful religious space artists have always tried to put in their work. 
Now you can take this as you want. I recognize and I unapologetically admit my bias here as an Arizonian who has nothing but absolute respect and reverence for this desert landscape that Heiser is gouging his trenches into. Okay, he's going to go look for an unraped landscape and then do this to it? Seems a little bit hypocritical to me. Now, it's just this humble art historian's thought that the point of land art should not include the destruction of land. Rather, land art, in my mind, is a celebration of the beautifully symbiotic relationship between man and nature. That it should remind the viewer about the way that nature can stimulate the soul, calm a troubled mind, and can provide a sense of wider perspective in a world that moves at one million miles an hour.